Brown girls, brown girls, we are beautiful. You are beautiful. We will not be interrupted. Welcome, UVM students, faculty, staff, friends, family, and distinguished guests to our 2021 Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. celebration. I am Dr. Wanda Heading Grant, Vice President for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, and I use she, her, hers pronouns. And it is my pleasure to stand before you for this commemorative celebration. I wish to acknowledge that UVM is located on the land which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange among indigenous peoples for thousands of years and it in, in is a home for the Western Abenaki people. UVM honors, recognizes, and respects these peoples, especially the Abenaki as the traditional stewards of the lands and waters on which we virtually gather here today. I want to give a hearty shout out to all the sponsors and partners that worked hard to make this moment happen. Thank you to President Suresh Garamella, Learners College of Medicine, Department of Student Life, the Office of the Vice President for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. And I'm very appreciative of conference and event services. Thank you. Lift every voice and sing the song that just finished. It was written at a pivotal time when Jim Crow was replacing slavery. Author and activist James Weldon Johnson wrote the words as a poem for President Abraham Lincoln's birthday. And it was recited as a tribute to Lincoln. And then Johnson's brother added music to it. In 1919, it became the official song of the NAACP. It spoke to the history of the dark journey of African Americans of blacks and the struggle to get to a place of hope. The song became a rallying cry for black communities, especially in the South, but it influ its influence reached well beyond those boundaries. There were, South white, there were Southern white churches, people in Japan, South America, and other places around the world who was singing that song. To sing this song is to revive that past, but also to recognize, as the lyrics of the song reveals, that there is hope for justice in a unified community. To know it, to understand its lyrics, it is not only to see with your eyes, but to feel it with your heart. It also tells you that black lives do matter. Dr. Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. changed the world. His vision encompassed far more than groundbreaking efforts for civil rights. He challenged a divided society to discover within itself the redemptive possibilities of social justice, racial equality, and economic fairness. His ideals and sacrifices have inspired many of us to live in this spirit, in his spirit. Therefore, we cannot continue to dismiss, dismiss the actions on January 6, Charlottesville, voter suppression, and so forth as political divisions and unprecedented behavior. We must tell the truth and teach the history, our history, the true facts. So let's get real, let's listen, let's learn so that we may be doers of good things for the betterment of us all. We must unite and stand and learn together to exile racism and other forms of oppression. For joy does cometh in the morning. We will have joy even in the midst of our trials. Thank you. And now it is my pleasure to welcome and introduce a person from whom the moment that they arrived on our campus, wanted to make sure that he was included in the UVM MLK celebrations, as well as be a part of the planning of this most beautiful program, commemorative program. Please help me welcome our president, UVM's president, Sharesh Garamella.
Good evening and welcome to the 2021 Martin Luther King Jr. Celebration. I'm glad to have so many UVM community members joining us for this important keynote address. I want to thank my friend Wanda Heading Grant and Rick Page, our Dean of the Lana College of Medicine and their teams for co-organizing this event. On behalf of all of us in the UVM community, I'm honored to welcome fellow Buckeye, Dr. Leon McDougall to our university as this year's speaker for our annual celebration honoring the life and work of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I look forward to hearing Dr. McDougall's thoughts on the important journey to health parity and the elimination of disparities in our healthcare system. Today, we honor Dr. King, our nation's preeminent civil rights leader and one of the greatest defenders of human rights in our nation's history. In addition to fighting the three evils of racism, poverty, and war, Dr. King was also committed to abolishing injustice in healthcare for people of color, particularly African Americans. In March 1966, at a press conference in Chicago, held in conjunction with the annual meeting of the Medical Committee for Human Rights, Dr. King declared, of all forms of inequality, injustice in health is the most shocking and the most inhuman because it often results in physical death. In his remarks, Dr. King called for direct action and creative nonviolence to end racial discrimination by hospitals against African-Americans. Fast forward to the present. We see that our country still struggles with health inequality, which has become starkly visible during the current COVID-19 pandemic, particularly for communities of color. And this history of mistreatment echoes in the prevailing distrust of the medical profession throughout these communities. We all have a responsibility, and this is especially true for the medical community, to repair these broken relationships and work diligently to make sure that historically marginalized communities receive the best medical care available from culturally sensitive healthcare professionals. Developing a deep sensitivity to culture and ministering from within that framework is a fundamental tenet of the people-centered approach to care at the heart of the Larner College of Medicine and the College of Nursing and Health Sciences curricula. I know we will have much to think about and discuss following Dr. McDougall's keynote today. Thank you again for being with us this evening, Dr. McDougall. I now turn the microphone back to Vice President Wanda Heading Grant. Thank you, President Garamella. Thank you so much. We are so fortunate tonight to also be partnering with the Learner College of Medicine to bring this event to all of you. And I'm honored to introduce Dr. Richard Page. Dr. Page joined UVM as Dean of the Learner College of Medicine in 2018 and has done so much to champion the work of DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion, since coming to UVM and Vermont. I cannot think of anything that I've asked him or his team to do regarding DEI and belongingness that he has declined me. So I thank him and them for that. Please help me welcome Dean Rick Page. Thank you very much and good evening, everyone. I first want to acknowledge Vice President Wanda Heading Grant and thank her for being such a wonderful partner and friend to me and to the Larner College of Medicine. It's an honor to join you all this evening, really on this historic day, as we celebrate Dr. Martin Luther King's legacy. Every year, the Larner College of Medicine has partnered with Wanda Heading Grant's office and UVM, developing programming in parallel. This year, we're pleased to co-sponsor the keynote address as we hear from a true leader in medicine. Dr. Tando, in a few moments, we'll be providing a full introduce, introduction for Dr. McDougall. 
But I think it's important to highlight that he is president of the National Medical Association, or NMA. The NMA was created in 1895 in the Jim Crow era South by 12 African-American physicians. An early priority was health care for all, which I'm embarrassed to note at the time was opposed by the American Medical Association. The NMA has continued as a collective voice for African-American physicians and is a leading force for parity and justice in medicine and the elimination of disparities in health. Our Larner College of Medicine has a student NMA chapter that's an important voice for African-American and other underrepresented students in informing and advising me and our College of Medicine. To introduce our keynote speaker, I'm pleased to welcome Dean Margaret Tando. Dr. Tando is an associate professor in the Department of Surgery, specializing in trauma and burn surgery. She's a valued and critically important partner to me as Associate Dean for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion for the Larner College of Medicine. Dr. Tando. Thank you very much, uh, Dean Page. Now, it is my honor to uh, introduce our 2021 MLK uh, speaker today, Dr. Leon McDougall. Dr. McDougall comes to us from the Ohio State University Department of Family Medicine. He is the first um, African-American professor with tenure in that department. He's also the first chief diversity officer at the OSU Wexner Medical Center, aka the chief collaborating officer. He's a graduate of the University of Toledo and the Ohio State University College of Medicine. He completed his family medicine residency at the Naval Hospital uh, at Camp Pendleton in California, and he earned a master's of public health degree from the University of Michigan School of Public Health, Department of Health Management and Policy. It was an honor for me this year in August, uh, on August 3rd, as a member of the National Medical Association to um, watch Dr. Medugu be installed as the, 100, as the 121st president of the NMA. This was also the 125th anniversary of the NMA and it was a big party plan for Atlanta and because of COVID you know it didn't happen but we will party someday. Uh, the NMA uh, serves as the oldest and largest collective voice for African American physicians in their effort to eliminate health disparities. What a year to be president of the NMA. Um, in his role he leads the NMA's mission to promote the interest of both doctors and patients, specifically those of African descent, to foster the utmost quality of care for all Americans. Leon has been very, very busy, as you can imagine, with COVID, with the uprising, um, just with everything going on. And so I'm very grateful that he accepted our invitation to be our MLK uh, speaker. Dr. McDougall is a diplomat of the American Board of Family Medicine and a fellow of the American Academy of Family Physicians. He was elected to the membership uh, within the Alpha Omega Alpha Honor Me Medical Society. Uh, he's faculty and is a member of the Rima Christian Center and the Association of Military Surgeons of the United States. I first got to meet Leon in 2012 as a new um, assist, uh, assistant Dean at the time for diversity and inclusion at the College of Medicine when I went to the American Association of Medical Colleges meeting. It is a huge meeting with thousands of people uh, there, but um, in the group of diversity, there's a group on diversity and inclusion, and I met uh, Dr. Madugu. I think he saw the deer in the headlights stare in my face, and he was very kind. He helped me around that meeting. And I've, since then, every year I've seen him at various meetings and he's been so generous with his time and his advice. So I, I see Leon as a friend, as a mentor. Um, he was president. Um, he was uh, the national chair 
of the WMC Group on uh, Diversity and Inclusion from 2013 to 2015. As a family um, physician, he, um, he has served a mostly older population on the near east side of uh, Columbus, Ohio since 2001. He's, he has been recognized nationally for his clinical excellence as being among the top 10% of healthcare providers for uh, patient satisfaction and among the best doctors in America. Please, let's give a warm, hearty, um, not too cold Vermont welcome to our 2021 MLK speaker, Dr. Leon McDougall. Thank you so much, Dr. Tando, Dean Page, President Garamali, uh, Provost Head Grant. I truly appreciate this opportunity to speak to the University of Vermont. So if my slides can be put on the screen, that would be wonderful. Thank you so much. So I too want to provide a land acknowledgement. I'm speaking to you from Columbus, Ohio, and with humility and respect, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional land caretakers of Ohio, the Delaware, Erie, Seneca, Shawnee, Miami, Lenape, Mingo, Ottawa, and Wyandotte peoples, and pay respect to the ancestors, elders, and present day American Indians. Now our objectives for this evening, uh, we're going to talk about the slave health deficit and its influence on health parity. I'm going to display some information about age adjusted death rates and also recognize the importance of investment. This is a celebration of the life of Dr. Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. and wanted to share this quote from a letter uh, from the Birmingham jail in 1963. We often hear the first part of this. I wanted to focus on the rest of the quote during this global pandemic. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. I am a family physician serving a predominantly African-American population in Columbus, Ohio. And when someone is having symptoms of chest pain with exertion that may or may not be caused by blockage of a heart artery, I order a cardiac stress test. The novel coronavirus pandemic served as a community stress test for African Americans. The results indicate that immediate life-preserving interventions are required and underscore the need for longer-term remedies to unequal justice, health, and health care outcomes. To date, social determinants are unfavorably affected by institutionalized, personally mediated, and internalized racism originating from a legacy of chattel slavery in the United States from 1619 to 1865, plus black codes, followed by Jim Crow laws that limited full citizenship of formerly enslaved persons and their descendants. 
despite the passage of civil rights legislation culminating with the Civil Rights Act of 1964, Voting Rights Act of 1965, and Fair Housing Act of 1968, health disparities continue to exist with no end in sight. Contrary to distinctions implied concerning health behaviors of African Americans during public discourse, the age-adjusted death rates related to alcohol-induced deaths and drug-induced deaths are actually higher for European Americans. In addition, the smoking rates for adults in the United States are similar for European Americans and African Americans at about 17%. In 1991, Dr. Michael Byrd and Dr. Linda Clayton, both MD, MPH carriers, coined the term slave health deficit to describe health disparities that African Americans continue to experience. So just wanted to highlight Dr. Byrd and Dr. Clayton and honor them for the work that they have put in to researching this topic. So let's look at the data. Let's look at the age adjusted death rates. So this depiction here displays on the top row all causes of death. And as we scroll down the rows, you'll see where there's uh, the major categories for death. And on the right hand side column, you'll see the total. So when we move down the set of slides, keep that in mind. So when comparing the uh, black female with uh, white female, you'll see uh, uh, and with the black male and the white male, I just wanted to highlight on here the fact that 26% of the age adjusted death rates from cardiovascular disease and 27.5% are within those two groups, whereas African Americans and blacks only represent 13% of the U.S population and also want to highlight cerebral vascular disease where you see 29.2% in the black female and 46.6% in the black male. Those two get categories especially are helping to drive these disparate outcomes in age adjusted death rates. Furthermore, some additional data concerning these differences in death rates. I'd like you to focus on the diabetes role. Black females, 76.8% and black males, 64%. Uh, percent. Just really troubling, alarming data in regards to drivers for excess mortality and just wanted to share the information about the drug induced deaths here as you can see the comparisons there's a few more slides here essential hypertension that's another area that health systems community organizations need to focus on to help mitigate and diminish the uh, disparities we see in age-adjusted death rates. You'll see here as we go down to the last row, breast cancer. These are very troubling data.
And one more slide here, I think. So again, depicting the age adjusted death rates compared comparing African Americans with European Americans. So to and the reason why I'm doing this because I want us to focus on the pertinent data. And and when we speak to unconscious and implicit biases, I want to help remove that from the discussion or allow us to have data to rebut those uh, mistruths and focus on real data and real drivers of excess mortality in the uh, Black and African American communities. Robust and strategic investment in African American serving institutions is a missing link for plans designed to close health disparities gaps experienced by African Americans. For example, Healthy People 2020. The justifications for such investment has been eloquently described by Dr. Rodney Hood, former president of the National Medical Association, Bird Clayton and Randall Robinson. And if the United States government can allocate tax breaks and benefits for the wealthy and corporations that will cost $2.3 trillion over 10 years, it's time for investment of a similar amount in African American serving institutions to an advanced health parity, whereby all African Americans have the opportunity to attain their highest level of health. For example, imagine the impact of establishing a $2.3 trillion endowment to increase funding of 107 historically black colleges and universities, including the Consortium of Four Black Medical Schools and the W. Montague Cobb NMA Health Institute to advance health parity. Health parity means that everyone has a fair and just opportunity to be as healthy as possible. This requires removing obstacles to health such as poverty, discrimination, and their consequences, including powerlessness and lack of access to good jobs with fair pay, quality education and housing, safe environments and health care. For the purposes of measurement, health parity means reducing the ultimate, reducing and ultimately eliminating disparities in health and its determinants that adversely affect excluded or marginalized groups. Now, let's talk a bit more about chattel slavery. During the 246 year history of chattel slavery in the United States of America from 1619 to 1865, all offspring, just as their parent or parents were considered property with assigned property value. The legacy of human rights abuses and unpaid labor enabling the United States to become an economic powerhouse is a foundation of justification for this investment. More specifically, the universal human rights violated include, among others, Article 1, the right to equality, Article 2, freedom from discrimination, Article 3, right to life, liberty, and personal security. Article four, freedom from slavery. Article five, freedom from torture and degrading treatment. Article 17, freedom to own property. And article 26, 
the right to education. What other factors distinguish U.S. chattel slavery? It's a cruel and dehumanizing form of slavery where African Americans were considered as three-fifths human, according to the 1857 U.S. Supreme Court decision in Dred Scott versus John Sanford, written by Chief Justice Roger Taney, who's been in the news recently uh, and holding him accountable for those this decision that I'm going to share with you now. Here are the words from Chief Justice Taney. Quote, they had for more than a century before been regarded as beings of an inferior order and altogether unfit to associate with the white race, either in social or political relations. And so far inferior that they had no rights which the white man was bound to respect and that the Negro might justly and lawfully be reduced to slavery for his benefit. He, has, he was bought and sold and treated as an ordinary article of merchandise and traffic whenever a profit could be made by it. Now, interestingly enough, Dred Scott, who lived from 1799 and died not too long after this decision in 1858, who was enslaved in Missouri, sued for his freedom in 1846 on the grounds that while he had been enslaved now get this, enslaved by a doctor, enslaved by Dr. John Emerson, a U.S. Army surgeon. He had lived in the free state of Illinois for four years and the free territory of Wisconsin, and that residing on free soil had erased his slave status. And I just read to you the verdict by Chief Justice Taney. Now, you may be asking, why wasn't this debt settled following the end of the Civil War? How has the slave health deficit existed throughout U.S. history? Sacrifices were made by Union soldiers and families of both European American and African American soldiers who fought in the Civil War, 1861 through 1865, to, pres to preserve the Union and end chattel slavery. However, point A, the hopes of reconstruction following the end of the Civil War, April 9, 1865, were disrupted by a series of events, including, but not limited to, the assassination of President Abraham Lincoln six days later. Now, President Andrew Johnson allowing Confederate states to rejoin the Union without guaranteeing rights for African Americans and rescinding, so focus on this now, and rescinding General Sherman's special field order number 15, whereby, now I want you all to pay attention to what I'm gonna say, pay attention, whereby the entire Southern coastline, 30 miles inland from Charleston, South Carolina to the St. John's River in Florida was assigned for exclusive Negro settlement limited to no more 
than 40 acres per family. In fact, 40,000 freedmen had moved on to new farms in this region. And lastly, the withdrawal of federal troops from Southern states in 1877 as a condition for the inauguration of President Rutherford B. Hayes, thus ending reconstruction and ushering in an era of continued oppression codified by Jim Crow laws. Now, uh, go to point B. Unequal access to health care and racism directed towards African Americans and African American physicians sustained the slave health deficit. For example, the American Medical Association refused to see three African American physicians as delegates at its annual meeting in 1870 and 1872. Yes, that's right. Five to seven years after the conclusion of the Civil War. This exclusion continued through the mid 1960s. In 1963, the United States had 5,000 African American physicians out of 227,000 physicians in total. Although AMA membership was often a requirement for hospital privileges and specialty training, African Americans were excluded from this predominantly European American institution. The AMA formally apologized for this exclusion of African Americans in 2008. Point number C. Former Princeton University president Woodrow Wilson, who became the 28th U.S. president from 1913 to 1921, praised the 1915 film entitled Birth of a Nation, formerly called The Klansman, after a special White House screening, reportedly stating, it's like, quote, it's like writing history with lightning. My only regret is that it is all so terribly true. His endorsement of this racist and fear-baiting film sparked the resurgence of the KKK white supremacy group, unleashing domestic terrorism exemplified by the strange fruit that Billie Holiday so eloquently sung about within the anti-lynching lyrics of the song written in 1937. And the remarks of President Woodrow Wilson fortified Jim Crow oppression against African Americans. Point D, the racism driven deaths from police involved violence and the mass incarceration of African Americans have worked to destabilize families and limit opportunities for wealth accumulation and lowered the health and well being of African American communities. Okay, okay. Aren't we already robustly investing in African Americans via affirmative action? That's, that's a question uh, that I'm going to answer. And the answer is no. <laughs> no. Affirmative action was enacted in 1961 following executive order 10925 by President John F. Kennedy instructing contractors to take, quote, affirmative action to ensure that applicants are treated equally without regard to race, color, religion, sex, or national origin, unquote. In addition, Ballot initiatives passed by majority votes within six states have prohibited use of affirmative action. In 1997, California enacted Proposition 209, banning all forms of affirmative action. 
in the operation of public employment, public education, or public contracting. The following year, Washington State enacted Initiative 200. In 2000, Florida pro prohibited use of race in college admissions, and in 2007, Proposal 2 enacted in Michigan prohibited affirmative action by public institutions. The 2008 Nebraska Civil Rights Measure 424 and the 2011 Arizona enacted Proposition 107 prohibits affirmative action. The next question may be why should our tax dollars be used to invest in African American serving institutions in support of African American descendants of chattel slavery because uh, perhaps uh, or because you weren't alive and perhaps you aren't even European American. Well, the answer is that chattel slavery was institutionalized, sanctioned by the U.S. government and codified in the U.S. Constitution. Uh, now, coming to a close in my talk here today, books have been written and unassailable testimony has been provided to the United States Congress that supports robust cross-sector and strategic investment from corporations and government organizations and philanthropic organizations in African American serving institutions to advance health parity and eliminate the US slave health deficit. This investment is long overdue. So I think I could probably just in there. Uh, let me just take a look at my slides again. I don't. Yeah, so the last slide just says questions and answer. So we'll relay that. Thank you for your time and attention. Good evening, everyone. My name is Paul. He and his pronouns, and I serve as senior advisor to Vice President Heading Grant. Thank you so much, Dr. McDougall, for sharing your insightful and powerful words with us tonight, in particular on such a powerful and moving day as well. I am so grateful to have had the opportunity to hear you speak about health equity and to reflect on Dr. King's legacy. And I think more importantly, the fact that we are very much a nation still struggling to form a more perfect union. So at this time, I. I'm happy to formally open uh, the question and answer portion of this evening's program. We invite you, our audience members, to please submit your questions using the question and answer feature right here in Microsoft Teams. My colleague, Dr. Smith, and I will be alternating questions as we go through. So we'll give some people uh, time again to uh, answer, excuse me, to ask some questions. In the meantime, though, Dr. McDougall, we wanted to just ask you to start off by talking a little bit more about slave health, excuse me, deficit. You shared with us, again, uh, some really, I think, remarkable and stark uh, statistics about the uh, discrepancies, if you will, in mortality rates amongst black females and black males and white males and white females. Could you tell us just a little bit more about, again, uh, where again, or how I suppose those numbers have gotten to that point in 2020 and 20, you know, and in the present as well. Um, are there things again that you and your work and research have, you know, seen that have led directly to those again really stark differences in mortality rates? Uh, thank you. Good question. So we have to start with the middle passage from that transatlantic travel from Africa to the United States, and then the poor or no health care or lack of health care provided during uh, that period of slavery. And then as I described with the presentation uh, in regards to uh, the 
deficit that has persisted and how even with the healthcare workforce, racism has impacted uh, the ability and opportunities for uh, black people to become physicians. And in fact, uh, from uh, 1997 through 2014, the number of black male doctors matriculating to medical school actually declined. So these problems are going on today. Now, let's pivot to our global pandemic and COVID-19 and uh, looking at uh, life expectancy. So some good news was that for the past year, past six years, the gap in life expectancy when comparing African Americans with European Americans was actually closing. Now, that being said, there was an article just released uh, last week displaying that that progress has been eliminated. And in fact, uh, the life expectancy for African Americans has decreased uh, over uh, uh, two years and about 1.4 years for those who are 65 years of age and older in about 0.6 for uh, European Americans in the age decrease. So there are some more data to help answer the excellent question. Thank you so much, Dr. McDougall. We've got a lot of audience questions coming in, so I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Smith, who will ask the next question. Thank you, Paul, and thank you, Dr. McDougall. We have a question here which reads, um, thank you for your insightful talk. Can you share more specifics about the most impactful places to make investments that would make the biggest difference? So that question I think is speaking maybe more to the table that I presented with the disparate mortality outcomes. So, so let's focus on investment in or focus on particular causes for death. So hypertension, cardiovascular related deaths, and stroke along with diabetes, that group of diseases, we can make a lot of improvement if we are able to decrease those disparities in mortality. And then that speaks more broadly to issues that would be addressed in an anti-racism campaign. I know here in Columbus, the Columbus City Council passed a resolution declaring racism as a public health crisis, crisis along with our Board of Health for Franklin County and Senator Herschel Craig has introduced similar legislation for the state of Ohio in speaking to employment, housing, uh, having access to quality food, I know we hear the term food desert. I like the term food mirage because where the food is available is providing empty calories and non-nutritious food. And so that's some of the answer to that. This is a, another great question, Dr. McDougall. Again, uh, thank you for sharing your important presentation with us. The question is, do you think it would be possible to reach health parity in the United States through our current employer-based health insurance system? Or do you think it will be necessary to implement something like a single-payer health care system? So the National Medical Association, we advocate for universal 
health care. So that being said, the employer based health care system is in existence. The Affordable Care Act was put in place to coexist with our existing system and put in place through our political process. And so uh, I would say that uh, reinforcing, decreasing co-pays, uplifting the Affordable Care Act uh, so that uh, with the new administration in, uh, bending it, not ending it, a lot of uh, sweat equity went into the Affordable Care Act. And so I would think that the most straightforward thing to do would be to uh, amplify its effectiveness through appropriate funding and identifying gaps for access to care within the Affordable Care Act. I think that would be the most direct way to move us forward as a nation. And that's speaking, that's the National Medical Association position is universal health care. I'm speaking to you from my perspective on moving the agenda forward. This is Sherwood again. Thank you so much. We have a question here that asks, what advice would you give to an early career African-American physician? Uh, join the National Medical Association, as I did when completing my residency in family medicine at the Naval Hospital Camp Pendleton. It's one of the best decisions I ever made. I, so I, I was on the aerospace section, aerospace, military, and occupational medicine section I had an opportunity to work with the first flag medical corps officer who was black dr guthrie turner he's now deceased so in other words i have a mentoring i was able to establish a mentoring network of admirals and generals <laughs> in my section and it's so the mentoring network that one's able to build through service, right? You come to the organization or whatever organization, if you're, if you're uh, Latinx or if European American, whatever organization you join as a young physician, becoming involved and saying, hey, I want, how can I help, right? And then you become like secretary or something of a historian of a section and you do a good job. And next thing you know, you're the, chair of the section and you're getting to meet all these people for free and uh and they become mentors so valuable so valuable very valuable our next question for you dr mcdougall is is it typical for medical students to learn about this history that you've spoken about and the kind of current reality that we are facing as a country. And I'll just add to that, if you don't think that it is, uh, again, typical, what might be your recommendations to medical colleges like ours and those across the country? Uh, very good question. There's a big move through the Association of American Medical Colleges to include anti-racism, to include historic reference, and cultural competency building in our uh, curriculums. Uh, and one example of outside institutions that have helped drive this would be the 1619 project by the New York Times. Uh, so, and I know at every medical school, there's persons that have this as a passion. So looking for opportunities to, uh, put this type of, or, or I, most institutions, most medical schools have some information about 
uh, uh, racism and such, but it, it's now even becoming more important to uh, highlight that and make that a part of the curriculum in a stronger way. And I just think people have, these past four years have really awakened the younger generations. And even just this past year with the uh, uh, White Coat for Black Lives initiatives that have been uh, uh, put into uh, visibility and, and effect throughout our uh, nation and, and medical schools. So this is a time to, uh, and, and I'm pretty sure most schools are uh, developing additional pathways. And as a student and members of the student councils, members of the Student National Medical Association, Latino Medical Student Association and others, you also can really uh, influence the incorporation of new information into the medical school curriculum and is, is welcome. I, I know, uh, yes. So you've sort of answered this, but I'm going to ask, um, do you think it's typical for medical students to learn this history and the current reality? So I think medical students as a whole have had the wool pulled uh, off of their eyes. Uh, and I just speak from personal experience until you really see racism or bias, until you've actually experienced it, it doesn't, you're walking around in the world and thinking everything's okay. And when it hits you in the face or what happened with the country, with seeing a man killed on television, begging for his life, there were no excuses. That awakened the country for those who wanted to see. And then every, few weeks you turn on the television and you see a black person getting shot and killed and usually they're running away from they're not even fighting or they're just going the other way they're defenseless and being killed so there's constant reminders of police involved violence and uh, I know in my role at the National Medical Association we're advocating for the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, right? Uh, introduced by Congresswoman Karen Bass of California. And then you have the uh, anti-racism bill introduced by Ayanna Presley, speaking to creating CDC uh, 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 organizations within CDC or focuses within CDC on racism and and also police involved uh, violence. So all of this is coming together uh, when I'm president of the National Medical Association. So we're, we're, we're engaging, we're advocating on multiple fronts. Thank you so much, Dr. McDougall, for that answer to that question. This one is an interesting one. Uh, again, it's another thank you for your wonderful presentation. The question is, what is the NMA actively doing right now with the Biden-Harris administration around COVID, um, particularly oh. either vaccine distribution or anything else related? So good question. So we met on Monday. Uh, we had, uh, this, we've been meeting probably for about the past at least three weeks or so with the transition team Biden Harris transition team. Our focus now in the meeting that actually occurred at 3 p.m. today was focused on dissemination and vaccination being put in arms and how uh, in working with the Centers for Disease Control uh, and 
how can we help to ensure that under-resourced rural, urban communities uh, can have access to the vaccines and black doctors and the patients we serve have access to the vaccines uh, to help expedite uh, this uh, vaccination uh, across the nation. We, we've also had with our talk today, uh, clergy leadership and the organizations formed, one being uh, Choose Healthy Life with uh, Dr. Howes and uh, Reverend Calvin Butts at the Abyssinian uh, Church uh, in New York and Dr. Uh, uh, Reverend uh, Watley, Matthew Watley uh, with uh, his organization. So, uh, so this is a good time to inform you about uh, the Black Coalition Against COVID. Please look that up on Google. There's a website and series of town hall meetings on video where uh, you'll see us speaking to the community and physicians concerning COVID-19. So this, so the next, so the, let me explain this. this I don't know how much time we have left, but the Black Coalition Against COVID uh, was, is chaired by Dr. Reed Tuxen. It involves a collaboration with the Consortium of Four Black Medical Schools, Howard Meharry, uh, Morehouse, and Charles R. Drew, the National Black Nurses Association, the National Medical Association, the Montague Cobb Health Institute, uh, and the National Urban League and BlackDoctor.org. So please uh, refer to that website. Also, uh, the National Medical Association recently released an advisory statement on COVID-19 vaccines, the messenger RNA vaccines from Pfizer and Moderna. We've been meeting with them, the scientists, since October and also reviewed the FDA information submitted uh, and the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices uh, information submitted and speak to the vaccine's safety and effectiveness from a Black community standpoint. And we support the emergency use authorization for both vaccines. And we're currently meeting with AstraZeneca and Johnson & Johnson concerning their vaccines in development. It's been a busy year. Sounds like it, sounds like it. Thank you again. Um, a question from Wendy Davis. Can you share anything about what you see in your current role? And I believe this refers to it, the Ohio State University around diversity as effective strategies that OSU is undertaking to address these disparities. So good question. This has really provided, the time that we are in now has really provided an opportunity for us to amplify ongoing efforts. For example, we now have a anti-racism action plan. Please go to our website, you can see this. And there are about nine domain committees under this structure addressing uh, issues from training to evaluation to the education aspect to talent and culture. So, uh, and that's amplifying existing work such as our health equity uh, subcommittee that's outward facing. And then from the medical center standpoint, we also have a diversity uh, Wexner Medical Center and Health Sciences uh, Diversity Council that's more inward focused with our Climate Committee, Cultural Competence Committee, Communications Committee, Health Disparities Committee, and Employee Resource Group uh, Committee. Um, so, uh, yes, uh, a lot's going on, and it's 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 the culture, and it starts at the top. For example, when we decided to implement implicit bias training. So our top 200 leaders participated in classroom implicit bias training. When we decided to enhance our 
collection of sexual orientation and gender identity information uh, with the upgrade of our electronic medical record. Uh, the, our executive leadership team underwent that training first by Equitas Health Institute. So uh, leadership makes a difference. Building culture that allows sustainability of growth and inclusion, all that's important. And you have great leadership uh, at uh, University of Vermont. Thank you for that, Dr. McDougall. I am very sad to say we're only going to have time for one more question. And I just want to really quickly acknowledge oh boy. <laughs> all of the Grab people the that have submitted questions uh, in the question and answer. Uh, there are a lot of great questions, and we're so sorry that we're not going to be able to get to them all. But this last one is uh, from a Chris Veal. Uh, so as you uh, alluded to, there is a large disparity of black and brown individuals and in medical schools in the country, and that's obviously fluctuated over time. Um, what do you think we should as a nation do at the middle school level, the high school level, and of course here in post-secondary uh, institutions as well, to increase the number of black and brown students in medical schools? And I'm going to add pre-K to that. So we have a initiative uh, at Ohio State called the Health Sciences Academies. So we partnered with the uh, feeder schools into Columbus East High School, which is right across the street from Ohio State East Hospital, and it involves a cascading mentorship model with faculty from our health sciences colleges to undergrad students to professional health professional students uh, engaging in uh, those schools uh, from pre-K through high school and their parents with the goal of enhancing career opportunities in the health sciences. So that's just one example of, I think, what the questioner was asking for an example of. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McDougall. Thank you for your truth telling, giving us the word. Um, I really am so glad that we were able to host you here. Um, as we talked about earlier, um, we owe you an actual visit to the University of Vermont um, and, on, and to our campus, on our campus. To all the partners, I want to give you a special shout out. Thank you, President Suresh Garamella. Thank you, Rick Page, Dean Rick Page, Dr. Margaret Tando, Marie Waterworth, Tiffany Delaney, Daphne Wells, Paul Yoon, and Sherwood Smith, and there are so many more out there. Thank you so much for helping us bring this to you this evening. Before I log off, I would like to invite you to save the date for an upcoming event, something I call my baby, the 13th Annual Blackboard Jungle Symposium. This year's symposium will be virtual, and it will be from March 23rd to the 26th, and will feature Dr. Eddie Glalad, Jr., and Judith Shepard, um, as well as others. Um, look out for it. So it's been a wonderful evening, a wonderful day, and I thank you, thank you, thank you. Happy heavenly birthday, Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Thank you.